Um, it's really fantastic to see so many people here today, and I just really want to give a particular welcome to the participants of UBC's program for open education and scholarship, uh, also known as POSE, who are joining us today as part of a unit on open education. Uh, my name is Will Ingle, and I'm a strategist for open education initiatives at the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology here at UBC. And I'd like to acknowledge that UBC, which is hosting this session, is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And as we're meeting virtually today, I'd like to acknowledge that here in the lower BC mainland, we're often on the unceded territories of the Squamish, tsleil and other Coast Salish people. Uh, you may be joining from different areas, and I'd like to take a moment just to appreciate and give respect to the lands uh, what, in which we are situated. And please don't hesitate to share the territory from which you might be joining us today. I appreciate uh, the land where I am as it provides me with a lot of opportunities. And when I acknowledge being on the territory of the Musqueam people, it's really rooted in the understanding that I, as a member of UBC, I'm really privileged to be learning and working on a territory that's not my own. Um, just before we begin, I'd like to note that the session is being recorded and you're, you're welcome to turn off your camera um, if you don't wanna be captured in the recording, uh, particularly during the question and answer time. Uh, and that we have enabled the live captions. Uh, you can control the live captions at the bottom of the Zoom window. There should be a button that says uh, CC on that. So in my role, uh, which is centered on open education, I do often acknowledge that open education is grounded in Western notions of copyright law and ownership. And these notions can be in tension uh, with indigenous and traditional ways of knowing. And so with that, I'm really excited to introduce and learn from our speaker, speaker Kyla Larson today, who will be exploring this topic in more detail. Um, Kyla, or Kayla is a Métis and Ukrainian settler originally from Treaty 6 territory, and she is currently the Indigenous Programs and Services Manager, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the Indigenous um, Program and Services Librarian for the WeWa Library here at UBC. She's also the Program Manager for the Indigenization Program, and she's also the co-host for the Ms. Nigen Iskwiak Book Woman podcast. And I'm just going to put a quick link to that podcast in the chat because it's completely worth checking out. Um, uh, to explore. If you're you're into podcasts, please do check it out. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to, to Kyla, or Kayla, sorry, to, to walk us through today. Thanks, Will. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining. And so today, the talk that I'll be giving will be focusing on Indigenous OERs, what exactly an, o an Indigenous OER looks like, and kind of the protocols or the considerations that need to be taken when engaging with Indigenous communities on either the creation of an OER or when we are incorporating Indigenous knowledges um, and worldviews into OERs that we are creating and how to have um, collaboration and consultation with communities um, if they have the capacity to do so. I'm going to ask um, to keep questions for the end. I tend, I like to talk to people. It's one of my roles as a librarian is always chatting with folks. Uh, so I'll probably go off on a long tangent if somebody asks me a question in the middle of the talk. So I'm just gonna ask that um, I will answer the questions at the very end. And then also at the very end, if we want to have a little bit more of uh, open discussion about indigenous knowledges in OER as well, we can have that. Um, and so let's get started. So Indigenous OERs, the six R's of Indigenous OERs, and hopefully by the end you'll be like, you'll have a better understanding what exactly do I mean when I'm talking about the six R's and how did I come up with the six R's and how can we start to begin to incorporate them into OER practices, but also thinking about how we can take worldviews such as the four R's, which I will be talking about later, and incorporating them into our own practices and understanding our roles as academics, students, faculty members, and how we have to begin to think a little bit differently when engaging with Indigenous knowledges. It goes outside of the kind of the Western norm that we're taught in academia about what is allowed to be shared, what is knowledge, who has authority. So welcome to the Indigenous OER panel. So first of all, I'd like to all just start off um, like Will did in acknowledging that I am here joining you today as an uninvited guest from the traditional territory of the Hunkamunum speaking Musqueam nation. Um, additionally, I live on the shared ter territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations. Um, and I am invited and sorry, I am an uninvited guest and an in uninvited indigenous guest on these nations. And I like to thank them for allowing me to continue to work and live here 
And also to acknowledge all the communities who you are joining from and the lands that you're joining from um, and the folks that have been there since time immemorial. So first off, when talking about Indigenous knowledges and kind of coming into this virtual space that we're all joining today um, in an important way and in a way where we're getting to know each other, I think the first thing that I always like to do when coming into um, presentations is to really locate myself and talk about the importance of locating ourselves. And the importance of locating ourselves will come in later into OER practices and working with Indigenous communities. So when we locate ourselves, it reconnects us to ourselves, our people and our stories as powerful forms of cultural resistance and is the basic building block to having deep relations with others. And that's what we're doing today. We're all in this virtual space, building relationships with one another. Now that you've gotten to see my face, hear my voice, and you'll be listening to this presentation. If you see me on campus, definitely feel free to wave or let me know who you are so that we can continue to build the relations outside of this virtual space. So when we locate ourselves, we often ask, who is your kin? So like um, it came up, I am from Treaty 6, I am from Treaty 6 territory, I am Métis, I speak very little, so apsis, a bit of Nihiawean, uh, which is Cree, um, so when I'm asked who my kin is, it's Tante Otsi Kia, so that means like, where are you from? Who is your kin? But it doesn't necessarily mean like exactly what lands are you from? It means like, where is your umbilical cord attached to? Who is your kin? Who is your mother? So that's what we ask. Additionally from that, we can ask then, what lands are we connected to? So where are you from? What territory are you from? What lands make you feel at home? From this, we can ask like, who are we accountable to? What nations and communities are we accountable to? Who are we accountable to right now? Um, as well as what lands do we reside on presently? So we have the connection to where we grew up, the lands that we are the most connected to, our traditional territories, but also we have to think about the lands that we are on in the present. When we do this, it helps us to acknowledge our biases, our positions, and our connections. And this is important when working with Indigenous communities, especially as academic faculty members, students, etc. It's really important to start to build those relationships and allow people to know where you're coming from and what your position is on whatever you might be talking about. So when I situate myself and to locate and position myself, I am from Treaty 6 territory, Miskwichi West Nigan, so Edmonton, also known as Beaver Hills House, but I grew up more specifically in a Miskwichi, so the area of the Beaver Hills, I grew up in a very small town uh, called Tofield, Alberta. The area of Miskwichi is a shared territory between the Sarsi, Cree, Anishinaabe, Nakota Sioux, Métis, and Blackfoot peoples and nations, and they've shared this territory for a very long time. Um, additionally, so when I'm talking about living on Treaty 6 territory, my connection to Treaty 6 territory is very strong. It's connected to my worldviews and my understandings of things like education, law, governance, relationship building, and protocols. So we can see here a photograph of um, Amisk Lake in Elk Island. I grew up not too far from Elk Island and Edmonton. So I'm very much so connected to Treaty 6. However, now that I'm here on the territory of Musqueam people and the Musqueam nation, I need to learn how to act appropriately as a guest on their territory and to start to think about their own protocols, laws, and governance structures. And how do I place myself within that in a way that I can be responsible, um, respectful and responsible to the community? Additionally, just to preface where I also come from, so I work at the Huihua Library here on campus. So on the UBC Vancouver campus, it is deeply tied to the Longhouse, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So deeply tied in our protocols and our understandings, but also in geographic location. We are right beside the Longhouse. Um, we are the only Indigenous academic library branch in all of Canada and respectfully internationally and nationally, um, internationally as well. 
And at the Huihua Library, what we do is practice Indigenous librarianship. So Indigenous librarianship unites the discipline of librarianship with Indigenous uh, approaches to knowledge, theory, and research methodology. Additionally, Indigenous librarianship, the major focus of it is to provide culturally relevant library and information collections and services by, for, and with Indigenous peoples. Additionally, Indigenous uh, librarianship is grounded in the contemporary realities of Indigenous peoples and Indigenous aspirations for self-governance and sovereignty. And this idea of self-governance and sovereignty is important when we talk about OERs later. A lot of the work that I do is connecting with community. My work is very outward. I have other colleagues, so Carlene Delorier Lyle, who's the information professional, uh, information services librarian, also an information professional though, but the information services librarian for the Huihua Library does a lot more of the inward work. So working with faculty, staff, and students on liaison work. A lot of my work is more outward, working with communities, working with other organizations to have conversations around things like research and OERs. So it's always good to start off by kind of coming together on the same page of what Indigenous knowledges are and what Indigenous worldviews are, especially because we're talking about them in the context of open education and open educational resources. So Indigenous worldviews, um, and these are from Leanne Simpson, but in general, Indigenous worldviews are holistic, slick, uh, slick, cyclical, and dependent upon relationships and connections to living and non-living beings and entities. There are many truths within an Indigenous worldview, um, and these truths are dependent upon the individual's experience. Everything is alive, all things are equal, the land is sacred, and relationships between people and the spiritual world are important. Within an Indigenous worldview, often humans are seen as being the least important thing in the world. And within Indigenous worldviews are Indigenous knowledges. So there's in general about three different types of Indigenous knowledges or how they evolve. So Indigenous knowledges are evolved from traditional knowledges. And so traditional knowledges are living chronicles and origins, trajectories and achievements of Indigenous peoples. Empirical knowledges, so these are careful observations and relationships to humans and non-humans. It's ecological and accumulated all um, over time. And then also revealed knowledges. So sometimes knowledges are revealed through things like dreams, visions, and, in, and intuition. And then there's five characteristics of Indigenous knowledges. They're personal, orally transmitted with exceptions. So these exceptions might be um, like pictographs, pet, uh, pectographs, so carvings and paintings on rocks, also tattoos, can be a form of knowledge as well and a story on our own body. Experiential, so knowledges can be experiential. Often we see this with experiences on the land. You cannot actually know without being there. Not all of your senses are activated. So I can tell you what it's like to go to Lynn Canyon and hike in Lynn Canyon, but you can't actually experience without going there. You can't smell the smell of cedar around you. You can't hear the water rushing you can't feel the softness of the earth underneath you. You actually have to be there and be present. Additionally, Indigenous knowledges are holistic, so they bring together the inner and the outer world, the physical with the spiritual. And then they're narratives. So often Indigenous knowledges use metaphors to present moral choices and self-reflection as well. And then within these knowledges, we can break it down further to different types of Indigenous knowledges. And each type of Indigenous knowledge has different protocols and protections and ways that we engage with them. So the first off are traditional knowledges, as we've talked about before. So traditional knowledges are knowledges, know-how, skills, and practices that have been developed, sustained, and passed from generation to generation within a community, often forming part of its cultural or spiritual identity. And often these are the knowledges that are most protected. And especially when we're looking at issues within copyright, these are the more challenging knowledges for communities to claim ownership within a Canadian context over. But also it's important to realize that traditional knowledges are some of the most important knowledges within communities. 
Additionally, we have indigenous cultural expressions. So similar to TK, as it often includes traditional knowledges in the output of it, and indigenous cultural expressions include things like dances, regalia, design, songs, etc. So for an example here, we have a jacket, so like a Cowichan jacket, and that would be an example of an indigenous uh, cultural expression. The meaning behind the design or any of the traditional knowledge or story that goes into the jacket would be the TK that's incorporated into it. In general, Indigenous cultural expressions are easier to cover under copyright law um, because they're more tangible. And so these are the things that we often see that being challenged within copyright law and copyright around designs, jackets, things like that. There was the case with Aritzia years ago when they had jackets that were along the lines of this. And those types of things are e more easily challenged within the Canadian court system. And then we have biocultural and genetic resources. So biocultural and genetic resources include things like microorganisms, plant varieties, animal breeds, et cetera. So this work with biocultural and genetic resources and when it comes to uh, knowledge preservation around these items is fairly new. Um, however, it's very important. A lot of the work around this is coming out of our relatives in Aotearoa, so in New Zealand and Maori individuals, looking at how they can take their own understandings and worldviews and incorporate that into genetic resource protection. With these types of knowledges that we've just seen, so traditional knowledges, the cultural expressions and the biocultural um, items, there are specific knowledge sharing protocols that go along with these different types of knowledges that differ from community to community. So often these protocols for knowledge sharing and data sharing use a collective knowledge and incorporate some type of law that is um, known within the community. And it's important to realize, especially within the Canadian context and having three different distinct groups, um, First Nations, Métis and Inuit, who also within these groups have distinct communities and language representation. Um, it's important that we work locally, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but it's important to also realize that all communities have different laws, they have different knowledge protocols. So what works for one community might not work for another, and that's why keeping it local is always something good to do when especially engaging with OERs. But um, it's good to know the local community and what their knowledge sharing protocols are and to ask first, unless you're specifically working with data or knowledge from a community like a Cree community, then ask that community. It wouldn't necessarily make sense to go to Musqueam and ask them about Cree protocols. So Indigenous knowledge and data sharing protocols often are dependent on things like ownership and inheritance. This can come at a community, clan or family level. They're earned, can be dependent on age, gender identity, geography, season. So um, we're just coming out of the time of storytelling. So winter in a lot of communities is the time for telling sacred stories. Um, and then we transition to more harvesting within the summertime and springtime. And then uh, another uh, Another kind of knowledge and sharing protocol could also depend on the type of technique that's being used. And all of these knowledges come together to form what in academia we would call data. And so it really is just a large blanket term for knowledges all coming together. So when we look at Indigenous data, there's data on Indigenous resources and environments. So this is our land data, water information. And then we have data on Indigenous demographics or social data. So often this is represented as legal data, health edu and education, as well as this can be Indigenous created. So we can have Indigenous health surveys that are created by communities, or we can have other things like Indigenous health surveys that are created by federal, provincial, and municipal governments. And then we have data from Indigenous communities. So this can include things like traditional cultural data, archives, oral literature, ancestral knowledge, or community stories. So all of these come together to form kind of the larger blanket of Indigenous data.
And all of this incorporates into Indigenous research, which is very different now than historically what we think about research or kind of a Western-focused idea of research. Often the Western-focused idea of research does not fit within Indigenous protocols around sharing of knowledge. And there was lots of problematic practices within um, more historic forms of research within Indigenous communities. So when we're thinking about Indigenous research more of an, in a contemporary sense, Indigenous research really is very community driven. It includes things like all of our relations. So when we talk about all of our relations, that's those who are from the land, the sky, the water, it includes plants, animals, mountains, and as well as the spiritual world. So our ancestors and those who come after us. As well as Indigenous research is accountable, so we are accountable to the communities that we work with. As an Indigenous person, I'm accountable to my community, but I'm also accountable to Musqueam. I am accountable to my coworkers at Huihua. And now that we're starting to build relations with one another, I'm accountable to the folks that are on this call as well. Indigenous research brings in Indigenous worldviews and includes Indigenous laws and protocols. And all of this comes together. And then we can talk about OERs and what exactly an OER is. Now that we kind of have a very um, basic foundation of what Indigenous knowledges are, Indigenous knowledge protocols, and Indigenous research, we can talk a little bit about the star of this week, open educational resources. And I hope that you had a chance to visit some of the other sessions that have happened or some of the sessions that might be going on so you can learn a little bit more about OERs. I am not an OER expert. Um, I am very thankful to my colleagues such as Donna Langill at uh, UBCO who works with OERs and is a specialist in open educational resources, as well as the folks at the University of Alberta who I worked with um, that also worked with OERs and taught me about OERs when I was a student and coming into library and librarianship. But in basic, if you miss some of the other sessions that have already happened this week, here is an outline of what exactly an OER is. So open educational resources, also known as OERs, are teaching, learning uh, resources, and they're also re research resources that are created with the intention of being freely available to users. They may include, but are not limited to things like textbooks, readings, multimedia files, and courses. Most OERs are covered by licenses that allow for the using, remixing, and sharing of items. As well as OERs break down barriers for authors when it comes to things like publishing. If you're a faculty member or a student, we know, or a graduate student even, we know that there are issues for folks that are like IBPOC folks, queer folks when it comes to publishing and within the mainstream publishing industry. As well as due to their openness, often things like paywall barriers are alleviated. So we all know how frustrating it is when we're trying to access information through a journal that maybe UBC does not subscribe to, and then we hit that paywall barrier and we're being asked for money. Or even when it comes to just in general how expensive textbooks are getting, um, now OERs can alleviate that kind of financial burden for students of having very expensive textbooks. And it's a great way also for academics to share their knowledge. And in some cases, sharing knowledge collectively between individuals and institutions. So when it comes to OERs, there's five R's of OERs. And these are important because these are kind of um, how we formulate an OER and how we look at them. So there's retention. Retention is number one. And retention is the right to make, own, and control copies of the content. And then we have reuse. So reuse is the right to use the content in a wide range of ways. So that could be your class, website, study group, video, et cetera. And then revise. So the right to adapt, adjust, modify, or alter the content itself. 
Number four is remix. So the right to combine the original or revised content with another open content to create something new. And then lastly, redistribute. So the right to share copies of the original content, your revisions, your remixes with others. So really keep this very colorful um, image of the five R's in your head, because this will kind of come into play later when we're thinking about Indigenous aspects of OERs and how Indigenous knowledges maybe don't fit into this. But in general, these are the five R's of OERs that are used. All right, so here's the big one, Indigenous content in OERs. I could have put Indigenous knowledges, but I put content in OERs because in some cases, the knowledge can be coming from a community. That's when I feel more comfortable in putting Indigenous knowledges are coming into communities, but sometimes it's Indigenous content. So that could be something like uh, the TRC's call to action would be a content that could be in an OER or the ISP from UBC. And if you haven't read the ISP, the Indigenous Strategic Plan for UBC, if you are a member of UBC, whether you're a faculty, staff, student, please make sure that you do have a look at the ISP and the goals of the ISP. It's a very important document that will play into courses, relationship, things like that here on campus. So please, please read that. I always like to stress that people take a look at that. So when we're thinking about knowledges and knowledges in OERs, especially knowledges that come from Indigenous communities, Black communities, other communities of color, from queer folks. When we think about knowledge and how knowledge has been used over time, knowledge is power. And those who possess that knowledge are in power in that moment. So when we're thinking about Indigenous sovereignty and self-determination, the ability for communities to be able to keep that power and that knowledge is important. Within the Canadian context, Indigenous nations in Canada are sovereign nations. Canada and Indigenous nations are two separate governing bodies living on the same land mass. The Canadian government recognizes that Indigenous peoples have the right to remain sovereign and practice self-governance through Section 35 of the Constitution. As well as Indigenous self-government is the formal structure through which Indigenous communities may control things like the administration of their people, land, resources, and related programs and policies. So this can include education. This can also include things like their cultural management and their land management, which come together. Part of this sovereignty that is really challenging, especially within an academic context, and this also looks as, at power structures, but one of the things that I'm trying to advocate for and use my voice and my privilege as a librarian and an Indigenous librarian who has that Indigenous knowledge um, and worldview, but also lives in this world of academia here at UBC, is to really advocate for Indigenous data sovereignty and the principle of Indigenous data sovereignty. Indigenous data sovereignty is not law, but it is something that we can kind of remind ourselves about when, when we're working with Indigenous knowledges. Indigenous data sovereignty is the concept that Indigenous nations have the right to ownership and governance over data about them, regardless of where it is held and who holds that. Indigenous nations have the right to govern data in a ways that align with their own protocols and laws, and Indigenous people have the right to access data that supports nation rebuilding. So often this includes access to government documents, both historic and contemporary and archival documents. However, one thing to note that with Indigenous data sovereignty and sovereignty is that often it comes up in challenge with Canadian copyright law. In general, in Canada, although it is changing and it's ever changing with conversations. Um, however, there's no change to the Canadian Copyright Act, but in general, copyright when it comes to indigenous knowledges is hard to prove. Expressions of traditional knowledge often don't qualify protect for protection because they are too old and therefore supposedly in the public domain. 
Additionally, the author of the material is often not identifiable and therefore there is no rights holder in the normal sense. And additionally, knowledges are collectively owned by Indigenous groups and communities for cultural claims and not by individuals for corporate or economic claims. So in one hand, we have the government of Canada acknowledging that Indigenous nations have the right to self-determination and to self-governance. But then on the other hand, and acknowledge that they are sovereign nations, but then on the other hand, we have things like the Copyright Act, which challenges that sovereignty and governance when it comes to Indigenous knowledges and who's allowed to use those knowledges and the protections over those knowledges. So when it comes to Indigenous knowledges in OERs, we really need to think differently. There's a different approach to Indigenous OERs than there is in making other OERs, mainly because of knowledge protections and sovereignty and making sure that we don't do wrong and replicate problematic practices of the past, especially when it came to research, of not asking. A big thing that we often hear within Indigenous communities when it comes to consultation is nothing about us without us. And that's the goal here with Indigenous OERs as well. So when we think about OERs, one place that we can start, and this is a great resource and a great organization for people to think about because it does bring in concepts of open access, but just kind of changed it is GITA. So GITA is the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. One thing that GITA, that GITA did is they looked at the FAIR principles of open access. So the FAIR principles are findability, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So they looked at those and created what I like to call FAIR plus, but their little hashtag is be fair and care, which is amazing because it's super easy to remember. And they created the care principles that go on to FAIR. So care stands for collective benefit, authority of control, responsibility, and ethics. So taking the FAIR principles of open access and thinking about it from a different lens, incorporating those Indigenous worldviews about control, responsibility, and ethics. And they have a website where you can learn more about um, the Gita principles and Gita themselves as an organization. So when looking at OERs, it's important to think who is the audience? So who is driving the creation of the OER? Is it an Indigenous community? Is it the public? Is this for settler education? Because this will be different in how consultation happens or how even the front face of the OER might be or if there's any restrictions. What is the age range that is um, going to be using this OER? And what is the education level of folks that will be also engaging with this OER? And the location is important too, as I said, not all communities. So if this is a community driven OER and you're helping to engage with the community to build it, it's going to have very different protocols than where you might actually be located. So like I gave the example of Cree folks and people from Musqueam as well. So the location is very important and the protocols that happen within those nations and your geographic location. Context, context is hugely important when it comes to what actually can be shared and not be shared. So context and content. The things that we need to ask ourselves in this case is what kind of knowledges are actually being shared? Are there any specific protocols and think back to the protocols. So what are the protocols that need to be adhered to when we are sharing these knowledges? Is there consent from the community to share this information? Is this primary or secondary information that we're sharing? Are we sharing elder stories? Are we sharing um, testimonies from important court cases? Or is this something else that we are sharing? So secondary information. And how can we actually support this OER? What is the role that we need to take in the support for this OER? Are we simply just a user of it? Are we, are we helping to generate content? Are we developing the OER? So there's lots of questions that need to be asked when kind of working with OERs, depending on you know, if they're community-driven, if it's for settler education, et cetera. There's lots of questions 
that need to be answered. One of the things though that we need to consider, even if the OER is for, you know, not for community, but for something else, is that we need to allow Indigenous peoples to take the lead, especially when it comes to information being shared about their communities, their lived histories, and their knowledges. The most important thing that we can do is consult with communities and take that and let them take the lead on what content and knowledges should be included in an OER. As well as we need to allow for the building of capacity for communities to create OERs at all steps, as well as building relationships. Building relationships is hugely important when it comes to OERs, academia, and building that also that trust and accountability with one another. So questioning the five R's, this is the thing to do. All right, so let's start thinking. When we look at the five R's, so retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. Thinking about indigenous protocols, protections of TK, copyright, kind of all the things that we just talked about, do the five R's really make sense when it comes to Indigenous OERs? I looked at it and immediately red flags were going up with things like retain. So if I am the individual that makes the OER, technically within Canadian copyright law, it can be altered, but there is that kind of that I am the owner. There's that kind of implement, implementation that I am the owner as well as reuse. We don't want all Indigenous content to be review, uh, reused or revised or remit, remixed. And redistribution can be highly problematic as well. So we really need to think differently. So as of right now, there are no kind of federally, internationally accepted best practice for an Indigenous OER. Indigenous OERs are fairly new, and there's not even a lot of um, academic literature being written about them. There are Indigenous OERs that exist. You can read the McCracken and Hogan paper, and it lists all the Indigenous that OER, Indigenous OERs that existed at the time of that publication. However, there is no best practice that is kind of like a standard that's been set out. However, the McCracken and Hogan paper did take kind of the first shot at what exactly and best practice for Indigenous OER would be. So their best practices are that relationships must come first. Again, coming back to relationships and relationship building. Nothing about us without us. Integrating things like the principles of OCAP into the OER development. So OCAP is, um, stands for Ownership, Control, Access, and Possession of Indigenous Knowledges. And it was created by FNIGC, which is the First Nations Information Governance Connect, as a way for researchers to engage with Indigenous knowledges in a way that is clearly defined by First Nations in Canada. The principles of OCAP do, um, they are meant for First Nations knowledges and follow First Nations principles. They don't necessarily follow the principles of Métis and Inuit. However, we can take examples from OCAP and kind of bend it towards the knowledges of Métis and Inuit folks here in Canada and their worldviews. Additionally, we need to consider that not all Indigenous knowledges are open and it matters how the information is shared. So I had mentioned earlier that the Huihua Library is very much so aligned and part of the First Nations House of Learning, the Long House here at UBC. One of the things that the Long House has is that they have their own four R's of, and these are the um, kind of the protocols of the Long House and their respect, relationships, responsibility, and reverence. So these are kind of the worldviews that inform the longhouse and those within it. As well as we work with the four R's within Huihua Library and they inform our practices as librarians and the ways that we build relationships here on campus as well as our understandings of a librarians and worldviews and respecting things like the sacred, which falls under revenants. <clears throat> 
Additionally, there's other four R's. So there's another set of four R's that are the four R's of indigenous education. And these are by um, Kirkness and Barnhart. And so the four R's of indigenous education are respect, relevance, they're reciprocal, as well as there's responsibility. Being that my life, my worldview and my professional practice is so influenced by these four R's, what I wanted to do was take these four R's and expand them. Take a worldview that I already know and expand it to fit into Indigenous OERs and take those five R's, kind of forget about them, and create the six R's of Indigenous OERs based off of these two different sets of four R's of Indigenous education and the Longhouse. So this is kind of how I came to the six R's. And I would like to thank both the Longhouse and uh, Kirkness and Barnhart for kind of paving the way with this idea of the four R's and how we can begin to think of our role within academia. So these are the six R's of Indigenous OERs. So the first one was respect. Respect for Indigenous cultural identity, communities, and topics. So we need to have respect within our open educational resources. We need to bring in relationships. So relationships connects to the concept of all of our relations and building relations with communities. Responsibility is hugely important. We, are we have the responsibility to share only when we are allowed and to publish in an ethical way that considers things like ownership, protocols, and community practices. As well as revenants, respect for the sacred. We would not share sacred indigenous knowledges, sacred community knowledges, or treat sacred knowledges in a way that they are lesser than academic knowledges. As well as relevance. So we need to legitimize and incorporate indigenous knowledges into curriculum in a way that makes sense and is controlled by community as well as reciprocity is highly important. So reciprocity and the principle of giving back. So for me as a librarian, I can give back by giving talks like this, helping with the development of OERs, helping communities to develop their own OERs and building that capacity, or helping to find information that might be relevant to the, o, to the OER that is being created through my work at Huihua Library or connecting with individuals like Carlene, um, my colleague. So these are the six kind of R's of Indigenous OERs. And I really hope that one day we have more of a better understanding and a group of practitioners that can come together to create more of a standard best practice for the incorporation of Indigenous knowledges into OERs so that we can begin to do better with our OER practices and challenge the idea of what should be open and what shouldn't be open. And so that is my presentation on Indigenous OERs. We have time for questions and dialogue after, and I wanted to leave some time for that so that we could begin to talk a little bit more about this. But I do have my contact. I have my contact for here at UBC, which is my work contact. Please feel free to contact with me about OERs or about Indigenous research or things about the Huihua Library, so the branch. And then I have my Twitter. So my Twitter is fairly active, mostly with um, folks talking about Indigenous research practices and data sovereignty, but that is my Twitter anti-librarian. One thing that you'll also find from my Twitter is often I like to retweet things from the Indigitization program, which I help to run here on campus, as well as from the Huihua Library. So all of our events, such as honoring Indigenous writers, which is, come, which is happening this week, but also kind of going through next week as well, and all the events that are happening around that. So please feel free to follow me on Twitter, follow the branch, follow Indigitization. Hi, hi. Thank you for being here this, this afternoon, and I will stop sharing and we have time for questions. And I hope there is not 29 questions in the chat. <laughs> also, please feel free. Uh, if you have questions, put them in the chat or you can put up your hand. I don't know well how you want to navigate this, but feel free to ask questions. Thanks, yeah, uh, I would just second that. Um, 
turn off, feel free to turn off your mic and ask a question or put it in the chat. So I see Michelle has her hand up. Yeah, I'm trying to articulate my question here because I've been absorbing a lot of knowledge. Um, I attended um, a session on traditional knowledge labels um, from local contexts, I think. And yeah. I'm just trying to see when my job is to advise people on their open education resources and give them the best way forward. And I know with a lot of OER, it's about best efforts. When someone approaches me with, uh, with content that includes Indigenous knowledge and or, um, Indigenous content and traditional, which may pertain to uh, traditional knowledge, where should I tell them to start? Because I know attribution and copyright labels is a huge thing that people concern themselves with. Sure. So for, for the group, the local context group develop um, their traditional knowledge labels. There's two different types of labels that we can use. The TK labels that they've developed often act like a Creative Commons license or in addition to a Creative Commons license, but they bring in to frame kind of Indigenous worldviews when looking at um, knowledges on digital platforms. However, there's been a lot of work of looking at how to use them in other contexts. So I really, I've done work with the local context group. I think reaching out to Jane and the local context group is always great as these resources are made for kind of a digital or um, a more open platform, but take into account the protocols of knowledge sharing. With the local context labels, I would say for OERs, it depends on who is creating it. So if it's an OER that's being created by an institution or another agency, there's a different license that would be used um, than if it's like a community creating the OER. So there's the traditional knowledge labels, which are community driven and decided by community. So if the community has been consulted on the knowledge that is within that OER and there's been that collaboration and consultation, then you can use the TK labels within it. However, if the community that this knowledge is not coming from has not been collaborated on with the development of the OER or allowed for the sharing of those knowledges, there's a different label technically that would go into it and it's an institutional label. So it's something that the individuals who are making the OER would put on to say that they acknowledge that there's traditional knowledge in this and that they would like to collaborate with the community that this knowledge comes from. I did pull up the TK label website for folks to see because they are very interesting and they are being used in different ways and have a lot of capacity for communities to alter them in a way that makes sense for this community. So this is the TK label um, website. One thing that you have to do now to use the TK labels is to be a knowledge hub or a local context hub. Huihua Library and in digitization are knowledge hubs, as well as myself as a researcher is part of the knowledge hub. Um, you just apply to be part of it, they verify you and then add you. And that's also another way of connecting with other organizations, communities and individuals. These are the labels that are meant for communities to put on their own knowledge. So we have provenance labels, protocol labels, as well as permissions. And you can see here, the permissions one look a lot like a Creative Commons license, but the protocol labels are a little bit different. So we can see that it's traditional knowledge, culturally sensitive, women, et cetera. So these could be important, especially if you have like a community produced OER or you have that collaboration with community. Then we also have the licenses, the traditional knowledge licenses, and then the notices. So we have the traditional knowledge notice, which signifies that there is an understanding from the institution or the creator that there is traditional knowledge in within the resource, but it has not been verified by a community. And then there's also institutional ones. So UBC could use this if they were creating um, OERs that have Indigenous knowledges. So it's attribution incomplete as well as open to collaborate with the community. I think for those who are not new share, for those who are planning on engaging in OERs, this is a great resource and they are the folks at um, local context are always willing to have conversations. 
about how their resource can be used and also lots of workshops, training sessions. They are, I remember when the TK labels were first coming out, it was like, you, I heard them speak a couple times and now they're all over the place um, and it's a great resource and can be used in other contexts than open educational resources, also for research, um, other digital, digital projects as well. Thank you. Um, just by you explaining that, some things slid into place. I feel like I, I've, I've, some knowledge has been like really, you know, when it just snaps too. So thank you so much for this presentation. Yeah, no problem. Jen, I saw you had your hand up earlier. I did. I, I just, I'm kind of wowed by this presentation and um, I don't even know where to start in a way. So I, I don't want to sound like a blathering idiot, which I am. Um, my partner, Zoe, is here. We're learning how to try to respect and honor the Indigenous knowledge as we create an open education resource in biology and, and pathology and human, human sciences. And I was really struck with you saying about building relationship and respect for the Indigenous culture. I just don't know whom or how or see or where to start that from. Hmm. So I think kind of with that relationship building, we're lucky here at UBC as we do have um, or uh, we have like departments such as ERSI, which is the Indigenous uh, Research Support Initiative. And oh. ERSI is really great at kind of connecting communities and researchers together in a way that kind of aligns with those protocols and practices. When it comes to um, finding Indigenous content and being able to incorporate Indigenous content into things like teaching, learning, OVRs, and kind of that really um, important, ver almost like verified secondary information, I would say definitely contact Carlene at the branch or myself as we do things in working with or um, folks like CTLT to collaborate on their Indigenous initiatives and helping for like faculty members, um, and folks like yourself for creating OERs and being able to in incorporate Indigenous voices into those resources. So I would say definitely contact ERSI for that relationship building part. Um, and then feel free to reach out to us when it comes to finding resources or even um, looking at lib guides that we have. We have lots of lib guides that are absolutely amazing and a kind of an area with tons of knowledge in it. Um, and also through uh, CTLT, they have their Indigenous initiatives. So reaching out to Amy Perot and her team would also be uh, really helpful as they might be able to help you. Okay, thank you. That's just, you just like jumped, we're like 20 kilometers farther ahead than we were before. So thank you. Okay. <laughs> Nina, I uh, see so you have your hand up. So. Yeah, um, I'm, uh, I'm working on a, a pro, I'm a, settler, non-Indigenous non person working on a, an OER for my um, Japanese language class and trying to incorporate um, material from uh, regarding the Indigenous people of, of Japan, the Ainu people. And um, I guess I'm looking for a little bit of direction on, on using um, resources that technically, in terms of Canadian copyright law, are now in the public domain, published mm -hmm. over you know, 70 years ago or whatever. And, and I can certainly um, acknowledge the author and, and that sort of thing. But in terms of, you, you know, I want to incorporate the, the voice of, uh, you know, the Ainu person's voice in, in that, um, as it is basically, right? Um, but how, how, how do I go about doing that with, with something that I know that technically I can use, but I'm not sure where to direct, you know, how, who to ask for permission in terms of someone from the community and that kind of thing. Yeah. So in regards to asking someone from the community, um, that might be a little bit harder. I mean, the one thing that we can always do is that within the creation of the resource and the OER is to just acknowledge where the knowledge has come from, give some additional information about the community and where the knowledges originate from, and really thank them. 
Additionally, this might be a good opportunity to collaborate with the Asian library and with the librarians there who work with the collections, and they might be able to connect you to community members um, or somebody who might have more authority to be able to um, give you information about how you could better acknowledge the, the Ainu community and where the um, information is coming from. But I think in general, that kind of locating and thanking of folks and for being able to use their knowledges. And even if you were to put in there like that you understand that within Canadian copyright law, um, this knowledge is met, is able to be shared freely, but that this might not follow protocol. And then adding something like one of those um, one of those um, institutional notices saying that would signify to somebody if there is something like attribution is missing or you're willing to collaborate or it just acknowledges that knowledge. And the local context licenses, um, it's not just for First Nations or in, um, in Canada. It's a collaboration that really started with Maori individuals and um, our neighbors in the United States as well. So it is used for multiple communities, multiple Indigenous communities. So this might be actually a good chance to reach out to Jane and that crew too, to see how they might be able to support your OER and working with Ainu communities. But I think checking in with the Asian library, um, thinking about local context, but also just doing that acknowledgement and that of you know, how prob problematic copyright can be, but also where those knowledges come from is kind of taking that first step to the redresses of, you know, the, in some cases, the um, sharing of knowledges that are not ours to share through academia. I hope that helps. I'm not an INU specialist, so it's a community I've never really worked with before, but just thinking about what we've done with other communities that I work with, that's kind of along the same, same lines. Great, thanks very much. Sorry, uh, Dagmar, I see you have your hand up. Yes, uh, my question, uh, hi, thank you so much for this uh, session, so much to think about. And we had that a little bit, I'm also part of this post course, and we had a little bit discussion about that in our previous session already, when we were talking about open access and, you know, all this copy Western colonial copyright <laughs> intellectual mm. system, which we kind of still have and follow in a way. and. We had some really interesting discussions there. I myself work um, about Tibetan Buddhism and um, also Bhutanese Buddhism. So I work a lot with Tibetan and Bhutanese communities and also partially indigenous communities within Bhutan and, and Tibet. And, um, and so I felt like the six R's are so relevant for a lot of other areas as mm -hmm. well. And are things what with, with I'm struggling with as a scholar often also. So, so what do I do when I have shared knowledge, when I have knowledge which is supposedly for some of the community secret and um, other parts of the community allow me to use it? And, you know, always you have this kind of feeling mm -hmm. like you're extracting something and you don't want to, of course, not do that. And you don't want to follow this kind of um yeah um history of extraction and so i think there's a lot of um a lot of people who work kind of in cultures that they are not their own basically have have to think about this all the time so do you have some advice how we can bring forward also this bigger discussion of changing the legal and you know other frameworks and learn um you know how to bring in all these important aspects respect relationship collaboration, responsibility, I mean, that, that should be, you know, on the agenda for kind of responsible scholar anyway, or teacher. So yeah, any advice, maybe it's a very broad question, I know, but um, yeah. When it comes especially to research and researching with a community that's not your own community, and kind of ideas around protocol and knowledge sharing and what should be shared and not shared. I think even starting to have conversations within your own unit. Um, so within the department that you work with, having conversations with community members and then having larger conversations with things like research ethics boards. Um, it's kind of the place to start. So having those conversations about where we're struggling um, when it comes to knowledge sharing, what is not working within the institution and what might be working. And then even looking kind of at what other institutions or what other communities are doing. And then how can we find kind of a best practice that fits within the communities that we're working with or within our own research. So just even opening up and starting to have those conversations, 
I find that usually the starting of having one conversation leads to a larger thing. And in some cases, transformative change happening within organizations and institutions. And I've seen that with a lot with Indigenous data sovereignty in Canada. When I graduated in 2018 with my master's, not really anyone was talking about it. Um, since then, it has become hugely popular. It's something that often is coming up at conferences. It's something that we're seeing lots of webinars on. And something that the tri councils are talking about now. So even opening up and having those conversations with both our academic community and the communities that we work with is important. And when it comes to working with knowledges that are not our own within the community, having a very good um, understanding with communities on what knowledges we're allowed to engage with, what knowledges we're allowed to share is the most important thing and building that relationship and building that trust with communities that we won't share something that they don't want us to share as well. So it's all about the relationship building, but also talking to each other, which sometimes academics are not good at doing. So not always great at talking to each other. So I hope that answered your question kind of. <laughs> so we're a few minutes past two and I just wanna be very mindful of the time and, and really uh, maybe at this point, just really thank uh, Kayla for her presentation today. I think overwhelmingly, I learned a ton today. I think uh, reading the comments, it, it um, I think people were really appreciative of your time. And I really just want to thank you again for taking time uh, to put this presentation together and to, to teach us uh, in this area. Um, yeah, with, thank you for having yeah. me. <laughs> um, with that, I think we'll go ahead and end this session, but we put your contact information in the chat and you posted it earlier. Uh, the session was recorded and we'll uh, send an email out when the recording is available as well. It may be a few days.